Uh, first off, merci beaucoup pour la invitation um, to speak here at the conference. That's about as much French as you're going to get out of me. Um, I just want to say thank you to Philippe for uh, organizing and managing things here on the ground and to everyone who's made me feel so welcome here in France the last couple of weeks. Okay, so as it says on the board, I'm talking about some groups attached to ModP representations, Galois representations. So um, I have part one, theoretical considerations. I'm going to go ahead and move that. Um, okay, so I will just tell you, remind you what a Galois representation is um, if you don't know or, or maybe you don't remember. So a Galois representation is just uh, a homomorphism from some absolute Galois group, so the Galois group of an algebraic closure of a number field, um, to some uh, automorphism group of a vector space. Uh, and a vector space, um, we take over a field, um, complex numbers or a piadic uh, numbers, finite field, or maybe some finite extension of one of these. Um, and yeah. Uh, so each uh, completion um, of our field K, our number field K, at each of its primes W, uh, induces an inclusion of Galois groups. Here, this is the absolute Galois group of the completion, um, and it sits inside um, the absolute Galois group of the number field. Uh, so we can restrict rho to get a local representation, which I've written rho w, um, and this, this really is just restricting, um, yeah, just a group restriction. Um, I suppose I should say that I've fixed a, um, a choice of algebraic closure. It doesn't really matter, but, but you know, one must fix one. Um, okay, so. Um, a Galois representation is called modular um, if it is attached to a modular form. That's perhaps unsurprising. Um, and the attaching happens in this particular way. Uh, we choose um, the special element, the Frobenius element, um, in our local Galois group. Uh, and then we look at its trace. And this trace should match the Hecker eigenvalue of some modular form whose coefficients, uh, whose Hecker eigenvalues sit inside this field F. Um, so that's what it means down here for a. Um, for a modular form to have a particular Hecker eigenvalue, this is just the Hecker operator at W. So hopefully all of that makes sense. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I will tell you a little bit about the Bloch and Cato conjecture, because um, this is a quite important conjecture attached to Galois representations. Uh, so uh, we're going to fix uh, a p-adic representation now. So our uh, our representation lives um, over some finite extension of QP. Uh, so the block cutter conjecture says that the order of vanishing of the L function of the representation um, matches the rank of a particular Selma group. Um, so I'm not really going to tell you much about what L functions are. Hopefully you've seen them before. You know at least something about them. Um, I will tell you more about what Selma groups are, obviously. Um, so an L function, just to be brief, packages together a bunch of arithmetic information. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we suspect that it contains important information about representations or elliptic curves or whatever object it's attached to. Um, and so this kind of mirrors the famous Birch and Swinnett and Dyer conjecture. You can tell they look basically exactly the same. Um, there's a slight difference in which point we're uh, taking our order of vanishing, but otherwise they look more or less the same. Um, this just says an elliptic curve's rank, again, is captured by the order of vanishing of the L function at a particular point. Um, so this is a general principle in modern number theory. L functions should encode arithmetic information. Um, so what should L functions do? L functions should encode arithmetic information. I've got this written down twice because I think it's quite important. And I think it was mentioned last week that repetition is a very good way to learn to have things driven home. So in particular, L functions should know the rank of a Selma group. This is a slightly more refined version of encoding arithmetic information. Uh, yeah, we really think that uh, for every L function, um, and it has a special value, there should be some kind of Selma group that is attached to that, that, that has this relationship. Okay, so I will tell you um, a little bit about mod P Bianchi modular forms, because I want to kind of pivot from block Cato to mod P. Um, and this is, this is how we do it. So if you remember last week, um, yeah, definitely last week, we had talks from Haluk and Aurel. Um, and uh, Paul, and they were talking about, um, well, cohomology, um, cohomology of arithmetic groups relating to cusp forms, automorphic forms. Um, and the Eichler Shimura Hada isomorphism for a uh, Bianchi group, which is an arithmetic group over an imaginary quadratic field, uh, connects the 
cohomology of the arithmetic group with its cusp forms. Um, I suppose this k should probably be a 2, um, given that we've only got complex coefficients. So uh, you can change this module to get any weight you'd like. Um, but yeah, this is the general principle. So as I say, if gamma is a Bianchi group, um, then we have an injection from the integral cohomology into the mod p cohomology um, for every prime in our number field. Um, and the, it works basically exactly how you imagine. You have integral coefficients, and you reduce them mod p. So this map is generally not a surjection for Bianchi groups. I think this was mentioned by Haluk and Orel and possibly Paul. Um, so this means that there are often mod p modular forms, so things that appear in this cohomology group, h1 gamma with fp coefficients, um, that do not appear as the mod p reduction of something in characteristic 0. Um, so these mod p modular forms, as they're known, are very mysterious. People want to know about them because they sort of shouldn't be there, really. We sort of expect that everything upstairs gives you something downstairs, um, but that's not necessarily, it, well, it doesn't necessarily go the other way around. So here's an example. Um, so I've taken an imaginary quadratic field. Um, this is the one of uh, discriminant minus 7. And I've taken a level. Um, doesn't really matter why I've chosen this level. You'll see why in a second, I suppose, um, that has this particular norm. And its uh, cohomology vanishes, or its cuspidal cohomology, I suppose, vanishes. Um, so with the integral coefficients in characteristic 0, we get nothing. Um, but if we go to fp coefficients for some primes, we get some stuff. And clearly, this doesn't come from upstairs, right? Nothing. There's nothing up here. So everything down here has to be in some way new. Um, and the primes that we get them for, um, in this case, are p equals 2, 3, 7, 13, 37, uh, 1,193, and 1,481,759. So that's a fun little example. Um, I didn't know that that number was prime uh, when I was writing this talk, but apparently it is. Uh, and yeah, this is a. Uh, I think Paul Gunnell's talked a lot about this, this kind of massive torsion that you don't really expect to see. Um, so these things are very interesting. And this is really, this is not, you know, aberrant behavior. This is really what it's like. Um, you see these massive primes fairly quickly. Um, so the data file I took this from uh, has, this is on Haluk's website, and the data goes up to norm 5,000 over this field. And the last uh, the last level, which is norm 4,999, has a prime with 37 digits uh, where we get this kind of torsion stuff appearing. So it's all very mysterious and, and shouldn't really be there, and we'd love to know more about it. Um, so these mod p modular forms, uh, parentheses usually, parentheses conjecturally, um, don't have an, uh, an attached characteristic zero object. So I guess I should say what I mean by that. Um, usually. Uh, means that, well, for small primes, p equals 2 and p equals 3, I think the expectation is that something should appear. Um, there should be maybe at a higher level, you'll find a congruent form. Um, but for these larger primes, I don't think anyone really thinks that someday we're going to find some characteristic zero guy that's congruent mod 1.5 million to something, right? I, I don't think anyone really believes that. Um, and it was uh, only in 2015 that Peter Schultz approved that these massive ones, even, even these massive ones for which no congruence is known, have their own mod p Galois representations in the usual way um, of matching uh, Hecker eigenvalues to uh, traces of Frobenius. Um, OK, so uh, what we want to do is study this supposed connection between L values and Selma groups, but in mod p, because things are a lot more computable in mod p. right? Um, so a modular form in characteristic 0 has an L value, which you define in the normal way, um, which if you know what that means, good. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. It has an L value. It doesn't really matter how you get it. Um, it's less clear what you should do in characteristic P, though, because for, for uh, characteristic 0, you have this L function that's this analytic function, and it's built out of all of this local data at all these primes. But we only have one prime. We're only working with one prime. Um, so what you can do is use a construction um, for a modular form appearing in cohomology. Um, and this construction uses modular symbols um, to recreate the L value. So here we have um, your L function. Um, and then this is a period, a sort of real number that you need to scale by, which I think we heard a little bit about yesterday um, from Petru. And then this corresponds to this pairing of your uh, cohomological modular form with this zero infinity 
a modular symbol, which just corresponds to integration across a vertical line in a three space, which again, I think Petru talked about yesterday. Um, and this just equals, well, I mean, it's a sort of a weird formula. If you've seen it before, you know exactly what it does. And if you've not seen it, then this is kind of meaningless. But um, this right-hand side can be computed. Um, and the kind of really nice thing is that this right-hand side still works, even if you're using one of these mod p guys that, uh, uh, that doesn't seem to have anything connected to it in characteristic 0. So even that mod 1 million whatever whatever one, um, this construction will still work. Um, and it varies with respect to this parameter q that you can choose. Um, but in fact, the number is the same whichever q you choose. So this is a really nice construction. Um, and it lets you build this mod pl value. So this should have some kind of meaning. And so what we want to do is attach a Selma group to this value. OK, so how do we do that? Well, OK, um, I'm going to talk about qp Selma groups first. And then we'll turn to mod p. Um, because this construction is sort of edifying. Um, we want to talk about how we make Selma groups for a p-adic representation. Um, OK, so a Selma group uh, is just a subgroup, <laughs> is just a subgroup of this group here. So this is um, cohomology, first group cohomology of your absolute Galois group with coefficients in V. Obviously, you get the action of this group on this module using rho. Um, and yeah, this is a very big group. This is a very, very big group. Um, I think anyone who studies it will tell you that they basically don't really study it. They only study little pieces of it, because I, I don't think anyone really knows how to write down a full presentation of the whole thing or anything like that. It's, it's massive. Um, so we restrict our attention only to continuous co-cycles. OK. Um, to, uh, yeah, I guess I'm just going to put a little bit of notation here, just because I'm kind of sick of typesetting this the whole time. Um, so I'm going to denote this Galois group of the number field by GK, and then I'm going to denote um, by dw the Galois group of this local field. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take this big group and we want to cut away all of this extraneous arithmetic information. So you should imagine it like you have a big, a big ball of dirt. And you know that somewhere in the ball of dirt, there's a little piece of gold in the middle. And what you want to do is you want to figure out a way to get rid of all of the dirt, chop it all away, and leave just that little nice little piece of gold in the middle. Um, and the way that you do that is with what are called local conditions. OK, so our uh, big cohomology group that we want to get rid of, we want to chop pieces off, um, well, due to, uh, due to yeah, dw sitting inside gk, uh, we have this map, uh, restriction map in cohomology. Um, and then what we do is we impose local conditions at every prime. Um, so w is a prime of our number field. And we just choose a subspace of this Galois cohomology group, h1 dwv. Uh, for every prime w. And then, um, and then we don't see what the, uh, OK, I guess I'll show you the construction in a minute. Uh, the most important local condition that you should care about is the unramified condition. Um, this is the first one that appears in all Galois cohomology texts, everything like that. This is the one that matters most. Um, and if you know what the inertia group w is, fantastic. Um, if you don't, don't worry. It's just a subgroup of your. Uh, dw, your local Galois group, um, that kind of corresponds to, well, if you know what an inertia group is normally, then you just do the same thing. It's this infinite Galois theoretic extension of your inertia group. Um, and what we do, we define the unramified condition as the kernel of restriction to inertia. Uh, so I should tell you why this matters, I suppose. Um, so if your uh, representation restricted to your inertia is trivial, your representation is called unramified at w. Uh, this is because uh, the unramified condition roughly corresponds to good behavior um, at the prime w. It means that nothing really goes wrong. Um, everything there is, is sort of calm and, and nice to study. Um, and so a set of local conditions is called a Selma system. That's what it says up here. Um, a Selma system if you're choosing the unramified condition for almost all places w. So this is to reflect um, the idea that representations that we care about should come from geometry. right? Uh, a representation coming from geometry means it's unramified almost everywhere. And then maybe there is some condition at p, potentially semi-stable. Doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, we want to reflect that. We want to kind of capture what happens for geometric representations. So we choose the unramified condition almost everywhere. 
And then a Selma group attached to a Selma system is just this big, confusing-looking kernel. Um, so we have H1GK, and we can restrict it to DW for every W. Um, and then we quotient by our spaces LW. And uh, what this has the effect of doing, really, it just means we're keeping every class in H1GK that lives in each one of our local spaces. Right? You can see that if, this, if our class in uh, H1GK lives in LW, it means in here it will be killed. Right? It will go to zero in the quotient. So we're keeping everything that lives in our local spaces. <clears throat> so why should you care about a Selma group other than the reasons I've already given you? Well, they, uh, in theory, are generalizations of class groups. Uh, so you should care about class groups, I suppose. <laughs> if you don't care about class groups, then I don't know why, why you're here or what you're watching this talk for. Um, so a Selma group um, is, is really a direct generalization of a class group. And if you have some, uh, some character, phi, from your uh, absolute Galois group, you can choose a Selma group construction that exactly gives you the class group in the normal way. Um, so this is what they do. Um, this is why they matter. Hmm. So Block and Cato <coughs> defined their Selma group in the 1990s with this, uh, with this particular Selma system, which I'm denoting LBK. So uh, for every prime not over P, they choose the unramified condition. Uh, and then for primes sitting over P in K, again, where remember V is a QP vector space, they choose this particular kernel. Um, and yeah, this slide is only really here um, to kind of give you a view of what it looks like. In fact, you should not attempt to understand um, what this condition over P means in a 40 minute talk. It's not gonna happen. I've been trying to understand it for a while now and, and you know, it's, I still have trouble. Um, it's, it's a very um, I've written it in the French spelling um, in honor of the fact that we are in France. Um, sometimes you see it uh, written with a Y as well. Uh, it's a crystalline period ring. It's one of Fontaine's period rings. And um, uh, the reason it's there is that the unramified condition over uh, P for a QP vector space is uh, really too restrictive. It, 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 it gets rid of more information than you'd like. So if you remember, you imagine your big ball of dirt and you're chopping away. The unramified condition you get your little piece of gold at the end, but you can tell that you've, you've kind of chopped a piece out of it. it it's not the right shape. Um, so this uh, B. Chris condition is, uh, is a sort of gentler, uh, a, slightly, uh, a slightly more permissible condition. Um, and that's all I really want to say about it, because um, that's all I really know. OK, so uh, we're going QP to FP now. So now um, rho is an FP uh, representation, mod P. Um, we still want to examine um, this, this uh, cohomology group, but now it's an FP vector space, but it's still too big. It's still some horrible uh, infinite number of FP vectors, and, and it's, it's all very bad. Um, so again, what we want to do is define a Selma system so that we can define a Selma group. And a Selma system for a mod P representation is just a set of local conditions um, where almost all local conditions are the unramified condition. And if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that the definition is the same. Uh, so this is a really, really well-motivated construction because we are taking the theory of Bloch and Cato and, and mod P, uh, p-adic representations and Selma groups, and we're just translating it to mod P. It works exactly the same. Um, so again, repetition is good for learning. That's really all we're doing. Um, so the dream is that we can just do Bloch and Cato's Selma group. Because according to their conjecture, which implies Birch and Swinnett and Dyer, and therefore, if you could prove Bloch Cato, you could prove Birch and Swinnett and Dyer and become a millionaire. Um, so it's a sort of an attractive prospect to try and recreate it mod P. Um, the problem is uh, we have this crystalline period ring. And it doesn't make sense um, to tensor uh, an FP vector space with this, with this characteristic zero period ring. The whole thing just collapses and, and it doesn't work. Um, so there should be some nice choice of period ring uh, that we can use to replace B Chris. Um, so there should be, in theory, some other ring you can put in here uh, and then tensor over FP. And this should tell you everything you want to know. I mean, I say in theory, what I mean is I would like for that to be true. Um, I don't actually know if it is true, uh, but I think it should be. This is kind of one of those things that keeps me awake at night trying to figure out what it could be. 
Um, so I don't know what it is, so we do other things. I'm doing other things over P. Uh, we're going to do some, some conditions that aren't, you know, Block and Cartos. OK, so <clears throat> yeah, I guess I should say uh, going forward, um, we're going to try other conditions over P, but we're going to keep unramified everywhere else. So all we're really going to tinker with is primes over P, primes over our characteristic. OK, so I'm going to tell you some conditions and then how they all fit together. So the relaxed condition uh, is we take the whole space. Um, this gives no requirement at P. Right? Remember when we had our big kernel um, with the product of all these restriction maps? Um, this map uh, restricts everything, kills everything. Everything goes to zero. So this is a very permissible condition. Um, and uh, yeah, this is what we write. We write this for the relaxed Selma system. And then because cell, L, rel, rho is a bit of a mouthful, we just write it as cell rel. Um, so this Selma group is sort of larger because we're not really cutting away that much. Um, we're just leaving P to its devices. Uh, yeah, as I say, it's very loose. It picks up lots of stuff we don't really care about. But it's a good place to start, right? Once you've got this, you can think about how to kind of subtly shave away some more information. OK, the unramified condition. Um, well, you know the unramified condition. I've already told you what it is. Um, and, and all we do in this case is um, set every single place, even those over P, to be the unramified condition. Um, ooh, and uh, as I said, this condition is too restrictive, right? It doesn't pick up everything that we care about, but it still has some content. Um, and so we write it, cell unr, uh, and it sits inside our relaxed Selma group. Because the more restrictive the condition is, uh, the smaller the Selma group. Hopefully that's clear. Nobody's asked anything yet, so I'm hoping everything has just been <laughs> made perfect sense. OK, good. So finally, um, the nearly ordinary condition, which is the thing I spend most of my time thinking about. Um, so a representation is called nearly ordinary uh, if it is two-dimensional and fixes a one-dimensional subspace, V1. Um, I think you can do this for general n-dimensional representations, and you get a kind of nice filtration. Um, that's all this really corresponds to, um, is we have, when we restrict to primes over the characteristic, we get this uh, fixed subspace. Um, and then under a certain choice of basis, our representation becomes upper triangular, uh, and we get this equivariant exact sequence, DW equivariant. Um, and I don't know, it's not much to look at, but what this allows you to do is define the nearly ordinary uh, Selma system, which I write L no, or L N O. Um, we're again unramified outside of P, and if we're over P, we sit inside this kernel, um, which you shouldn't really <laughs> have any idea what that kernel means just from looking at it, right? I mean, this is one of the problems with studying Selma groups is you can write down all these definitions and you can show that they give you a Selma group, but when you try and explain what exactly they mean to, to anyone who doesn't study a Selma group, you sound insane. Why this should be an interesting thing to care about is kind of beyond me, really, and, and I'm the one who cares about it. So don't worry too much. It's, it's just this is a kind of choice that you make for technical reasons. There's a paper of Greenberg where he explains why it matters. So you can read that if you're interested. OK, so the three Selma groups fit together like this. We have our relaxed Selma group up here, and we have our unramified one at the bottom, and we have this nearly ordinary Selma group sits in the middle. Sometimes they're equal, sometimes they're not. Um, and so if you are familiar with the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you'll know that Goldilocks breaks into the Three Bears' house, um, and she tries their porridge. Daddy Bear's porridge is too hot. Mommy Bear's porridge is too cold. Baby Bear's porridge is just right. Um, and so that is what the hope is for the nearly ordinary Selma group, is that the relaxed group is Daddy Bear, the unramified group is Mommy Bear, and then there's Baby Bear in the middle. They look very happy, don't they? I'm going to leave that up for a second while I take a drink. <laughs> You can think about whether or not this will end up being true. <clears throat> I was just pleased that I figured out how to uh, make them appear in the right order. OK, so <clears throat> practical considerations, part two. Um, so to compute with a mod p representation, first we need a way to represent it. Ha -ha. Uh, so a continuous representation into a uh, mod p vector space like this. I, I suppose I'm sticking just to fp, but you can do this for fq as well. It's not really a problem. Um, but let's just stick with rational ones for the moment. Um, 
This has finite image, uh, a Galois representation. Continuous Galois representation has finite image. This is due to a continuity argument. And so uh, the fixed field of the kernel is a finite extension of K. So I'll just take a moment to think about that, what that means. We're taking everything in our representation row, um, well, everything in our, uh, sorry, in our Gawa group, um, GK, and then um, everything that doesn't have any effect, i.e. that is killed by rho, uh, we take the field fixed by that. And this is a finite Gawa extension of K, and I don't think I wrote it down on the board, um, but this extension, L over K, tells us everything we need to know in the sense that the image um, of the representation rho is exactly the Gawa group of L over K. So this really does have everything you care about. So here's an example. Let E be this particular elliptic curve. It has conductor 229. Um, you can take its two torsion points to form a mod 2 Galois representation, two-dimensional in the usual way. Um, and this goes from GQ to GL2, uh, GLF2 squared. And the fixed field of the kernel is this number field, um, which Again, you can kind of look at and believe that that's a number field. It is, and it's Galois, and its uh, image is GL2, F2. Um, it's a, quite a nice sort of symmetrical looking polynomial. They generally aren't, but, but that's a nice one. So I thought I'd put a nice one on the board. Um, generally, these Galois representations, the coefficients are much bigger, um, and the number fields are much bigger. And, and so this is a sort of, this is one that fits on a board and you can look at. OK, so. If you believe that you can, given a representation, find the number field, uh, you now want to understand the Selma group, right? Or the Selma groups, depending on which one you care about. So it's not obvious what these classes should look like, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> how you find a class, let alone how you find a class that satisfies conditions you care about, is not particularly clear. If you know what group cohomology is, then you know that you have some kind of twisted homomorphisms from this big group. Um, and the image lies in this vector space. But how you compute those twisted homomorphisms, given we don't really understand this big group, is kind of, uh, kind of difficult. Um, and the tool that comes to our rescue is the information restriction uh, sequence, uh, which is a tool from cohomology, group cohomology. And it lets us take this short exact sequence. Um, kernel of rho sits inside GK. And this goes to GK mod kernel of rho. This is the, basically the prototypical exact sequence, right? This is a normal subgroup and then a quotient. Um, and and uh, I suppose this isomorphism is also true. GK mod the kernel is isomorphic to this Galois group of L over K. Um, and, and what we do is we plug this into our uh, cohomology, and it gives us this long exact sequence. So we start with this uh, cohomology of a finite group. Um, and then we have the group that we care about. And then we have this kind of monster that I'll talk about in a second. And then we have um, H2 of our finite group. Uh, and so in general, h1 and h2 of our finite group with coefficients in v should vanish. Um, they don't always. There's like a small list of exceptions for every, for every um, image uh, inside. Well, for every prime, um, there's a small set of subgroups of GL2 FP that, that don't vanish. But if you avoid those, and most of the interesting cases do, then they vanish. Um, and this exact sequence then turns into an isomorphism, right? You've got a 0 here and a 0 here. And uh, what I've done, line 1 to line 2 here, is I have translated this um, H1 into a homomorphism group. And the way that this works is, uh, well, kernel of V, uh, sorry, kernel of rho acts on V trivially, right? That's what it means to be in the kernel of rho. The action on V is given by rho, so everything in the kernel acts trivially. Uh, and so our twisted homomorphisms just become homomorphisms because we were twisting by the action of rho, but the action of rho disappears. So these become homomorphisms, and then they are uh, invariant with respect to this finite Galois group, which you can kind of make sense. This, this uh, finite Galois group you can kind of understand as this quotient, and then this quotient gives you a way of understanding um, what the kernel of rho, how the homomorphisms all interact with one another. Apologies to people on Zoom who can't see the laser pointer. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's roughly how that works. Um, so the point is that we have uh, an isomorphism between these two things, generally, or maybe a surjection or maybe an injection, depending on what happens over here and over here. But in general, it's an isomorphism. And so elements in this homomorphism group are much easier to study 
um, because they give rise to Galois extensions of our number field L. Um, and the Galois group of M over L, where M is this fixed field, fixed now instead by the kernel of F, um, they have Galois group isomorphic to V as an additive group. So for our purposes, V is um, FP plus FP. Uh, so it's just as now instead of a vector space, it's just an additive abelian group. Um, and our local conditions in cohomology now translate, finally, there's a punchline, they translate into ramification properties in the extension. So these kind of weird and opaque conditions that you saw for cohomology actually have fairly nice interpretations um, when you go to this number field setting. Um, and I'm sorry that these aren't aligned. I couldn't figure out how to do it. I don't know why these are right justified. Um, some kind of ghost within the, the, the fabric of LaTeX wanted me to not be able to align these properly in the middle. So sorry for people to people for whom that's annoying. But anyway, um, the relaxed condition tells you nothing, right? Because it puts no condition at P. Um, so we don't really care what happens at P for the relaxed condition. Just we allow it to ramify however it would like. Uh, the nearly ordinary condition says that the inertia group um, for primes over W, where now, remember, W sits over P, um, does it, the inertia group of this extension, M over L, sits inside our fixed space, this fixed subspace V1. And then the unramified condition says that M over L is unramified at primes over P. So remember when I said that... Um, Unramified Selma groups are very restrictive, but they still capture something interesting. This is what they capture. They capture extensions um, of our number field L that are unramified everywhere, right? Unramified outside of P, unramified over P. They capture these really kind of quite special extensions that you, you don't really expect to see those most of the time, right? Um, OK, so to compute these groups, uh, all we have to do is find every extension M over L that is unramified outside P with the right Galois group, and then some technical conditions that I'm not telling you about. And all of these will give you um, uh, lines in your Selma group. Um, lines because um, if you scale your homomorphism F here, then you get the same fixed field. Um, that's kind of a technical point. Um, but yeah, they correspond not to elements, but lines. But that's OK. Um, lines can be dealt with. So here's a picture. Here's a nice picture, and did I label it? I did. Um, no, I didn't. OK, fine. So A um, is just some big abelian extension um, that is unramified outside of P uh, and has a kind of whose Galois group is some number of copies of P, F, uh, Z mod PZ. Uh, and then all of these extensions, M1, sit inside it. And they have Galois group isomorphic to V as an additive group sitting over L, which is the kernel, uh, the fixed field of the kernel of rho sitting over our base field K. So hopefully this picture has everything you need to know. Good. Um, yeah, so as I say, there are some technical conditions, but I won't bore you with what those are because they only really matter in the computation. Um, they don't really tell you anything interesting about the problem. So go back to this example of this elliptic curve, um, and it's two torsion points forming this representation. Uh, we want to find the extensions, and the way we do that is using class field theory, right? We have we want to find abelian extensions, and we want them to be unramified outside of a particular set, and then we want maybe particular ramification at that set. This is exactly what class field theory is for, and all of this can be done very explicitly over the rationals and over um, uh, imaginary quadratic fields, and possibly other places too. I don't really care about other places; those are the two cases that interest me. Um, so. We choose our modulus m. Um, in this case, it is two lots of the integer ring. And again, I'm using the French notation. Um, two lots of our integer ring to some power e. Um, e is just an index that we choose in order to capture all possible extensions of the kind we want. And it's a technical point that such an e should exist. Um, but I suppose if you think about it, um, these extensions, m over l, can only be so ramified. They can only be ramified kind of up to the degree, which is p squared. Um, so this E, you can choose um, in a particular way. In this case, it's 4. I think it's a coincidence that E is P squared here. I wouldn't, that isn't in general what E should look like. I think it's just, in this case, it happens to look like this. Um, and what we get is this ray class field attached to this modulus um, that has this Galois group. We get eight copies of Z mod 2Z and then a copy of Z mod 4Z. And then what we do is um, a very quick computation that runs through all of the possible extensions with the right Galois group 
satisfying all our technical conditions. And we find seven sub-extensions, um, M sitting inside A over L. Um, and these give us seven lines in our vector space cell rel, the relaxed Selma group. OK, seven lines. Does anyone have any idea what rank that might be? That's fair. It's kind of a mean question. Um, so there's a standard formula. Oh, OK, yeah, Paul got it. Very good. Well done. Um, yes. Three is quite right. So there's a, there's a nice formula that tells you um, if you have so many lines in an FP vector space, here's the rank. Um, and you plug it in, and you get that the rank is three. In this case, it's whatever power of two, seven is, is one less than, which obviously is, is three. Um, OK, super. Um, you can do a finer analysis um, where you try and detect this particular ramification condition, um, where this inertia group sits inside this fixed line. Uh, this is a very fine analysis. It took, it took a while for me to get this fully implemented, because there's a lot, of, a lot of very annoying technical details that go into it. But you can do it. Um, and this gives you uh, three lines. I guess I've spoiled the chance to guess, but I guess I already told you the uh, formula. So the, relang uh, the relaxed, uh, sorry, the rank of the nearly ordinary Selma group is two. Great. And finally, um, we just have to check all of them, how they ramify at P. And only one of them is unramified at P is two. Uh, so the unramified Selma group has rank one. And as you see, I was not lying earlier when I said that unramified sits inside nearly ordinary, sits inside relaxed. So this is good. Um, this is very good. So the question is, is the nearly ordinary cell group condition the Goldilocks condition that we care about? The one that is not too hot and not too cold, that captures just the right amount of information? And uh, sadly, I think the answer is probably no. Um, this is a bit disappointing, because it took a while to figure out how to implement these. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the uh, nearly ordinary Selma group seems to overestimate um, so this is kind of, we're kind of leaving the realm of rigorous mathematics and entering the realm of speculation, where I imagine that there is some correct notion of a mod p Selma group that exactly captures mod p L values, which again, I think there should be, but maybe there is not. Um, but if there is, then the nearly ordinary Selma group is not it. It tends to overestimate. Um, and there's an asterisk there, because um, sometimes it tends to not overestimate, but that's a separate problem. Um, so I have, uh, I have got a Selma group that I can compute. So I have done some arithmetic statistics. Um, so if we take all elliptic curves up to conductor 2000, um, we get this many isomorphism classes of representation. Uh, and this corresponds, uh, we get, uh, I guess, this many isomorphism classes that are nearly ordinary. So not all representations are. Some don't have this nice decomposition property. But about 70% of them are. So that's all right. 70% is not bad. It's a sort of workable condition. Um, some representations will fix more than one line. So we get more than one Selma group per representation for, I think, seven of them in this case. Um, and so we calculate the average rank, and we see that the average rank is 1.25, thereabouts. So an interesting thing to note on this slide is that we have no nearly ordinary Selma groups of rank zero. So you should think about that. Um, that's important. I mean, I don't know, it's fairly important. Um, if nearly ordinary Selma groups exactly captured ranks of elliptic curves, which maybe they shouldn't, but if they did, um, then you should expect the rank to be about one half. Because uh, this is, I think, the expected average rank of elliptic curves. Uh, so we're getting quite a bit more than one half. Um, and maybe there's good reasons this shouldn't be true. Um, but, but if you do expect it to be true, then certainly your nearly ordinary Selma group is not giving you quite what you want. <clears throat> so here is a table that I have drawn uh, using LaTeX. Uh, and I have run this um, arithmetic statistics uh, to quite a lot larger bounds. Um, so <laughs> this uh, previous bound was 2,000. The best bound I've got is this 100 up to conductor 150,000 um, from elliptic curves in the LMFDB. Um, there was a table, there was a row in this table for the rational field at the top here. Um, but that one's not done yet. Um, there's 500,000 elliptic curves. That are kind of you get all of them up to up to norm uh, up to conductor 500,000. Sorry, so I think there's something like two three million of those. Um, so that's running on a computer somewhere in Sheffield, um, but it, it wasn't done in time for this talk, which is very sad. Um, so I had to use some old data. But anyway, um, there's a couple of interesting things about this table, I guess. Um, so you can see the nearly ordinary Selma rank is sort of quite uniformly big, uh, bigger than one half certainly. Maybe this one half thing. Um, expected rank shouldn't be true for quadratic fields. 
Um, but, but in any case, the nearly ordinary Selman group tends to be more than one um, in terms of its average rank. Uh, and about 70% of representations are nearly ordinary, um, except for this field here um, and this field here. Uh, and the difference between these two fields and the rest of them is that the prime two splits. Um, so this is the imaginary quadratic field of discriminant minus seven, and this is the real quadratic field of discriminant 17. Uh, and yeah, this, this split prime means that in order to be nearly ordinary at, at the prime two, you now have two conditions to satisfy. You need to fix a line in your first decomposition group, and you need to fix a line in your second. So this is more restrictive. So you expect fewer representations to be nearly ordinary. Uh, what you don't expect, I think, is for so few to be nearly ordinary. This is kind of weird. Um, I look at this data and I think, well, if it's about a 70% chance of being nearly ordinary at one prime, then it should be 70% times 70%, which is about 50%, to be nearly ordinary at two primes. But it's actually quite a lot smaller than that, which is very odd. Um, and I can't explain that. So if anyone has any ideas what that might be about, please do tell me. Finally, this last line here, um, the average rank is two, which is incredible. I mean, we've got an average rank of exactly two. Uh, that's because there's only one. Um, this is the danger of a table that doesn't have all of the columns in it. Slides aren't wide enough for the whole table. But yeah, there's only one nearly ordinary representation over this field um, up to this conductor. So yeah, you shouldn't put too much stock into that, I don't think. <clears throat> yeah? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, maybe I should say something about that. Fair point. Um, so what does the field notation mean? Um, so these are the labels that the LMFDB gives to fields. Um, I spend most of my day on the LMFDB. I've developed for the LMFDB, so I'm a, I'm a big shill for the LMFDB. Um, these notations, uh, well, so these are uh, the number of real places. OK, so actually, I'll start from the beginning. The number is the um, degree. The, the first number is the degree, so that's always 2, right? These are quadratic fields. The second number is the number of real places. So these are all imaginary quadratics, and these are all real quadratics. Um, and then the next number is the discriminant. And then I think the uh, fourth number is the class number, something like that, or maybe some, some last piece of differentiating data. This is a thing that happens on the LMFDB sometimes, is they just have to choose a number in order to differentiate two things that have the same label. Um, so it's possible that that's what that number means. I don't actually remember. Um, but yeah, these are just ways of identifying the fields. The only real number that matters here, I think, is this middle, this kind of third one, right? These are the imaginary quadratic fields. Um, of discriminants minus 3, minus 4, minus 7, minus 8, minus 11, minus 19. And then these are the real quadratics. And the table was bigger as well. There were, there were kind of more, more rows for the imaginary and more rows for the real, but the slide is only so big. So, um, All right, I am getting close to the end of my time, so I will say not very much more. Um, so I have some mod 2 considerations um, that, that you should think about. So in characteristic 2, the cell value is always 0. Um, which is interesting. Um, and you can show this, again, using a modular symbols argument. Um, and for a full image mod 2 representation, the nearly ordinary Selma group over Q seems to always have rank bigger than 1. Um, so I've checked this for lots and lots of them. I've not seen a single 1 be 0. And I think I have a construction that gives you this uh, extension all of the time, but I haven't proved it properly. So uh, TBD. Uh, but it seems that. What we have is an L value that vanishes always, and a Selma group that, is, um, that has positive rank always. And this seems kind of good, right? This is, oh, whoopsie daisy. Um, and this is exactly what the uh, conjecture wants, right? We want to have a vanishing L value means positive rank. Or maybe a positive rank just means a pos uh, vanishing L value, depending on mod p considerations. Um, but this is probably just a coincidence, I think. I think that the vanishing of this L value uh, it's a really, really basic, straightforward argument. I figured it out in the first, I think, six months of doing my PhD, which should tell you how easy it is to figure out, right? Uh, if somebody who's not been a PhD student for a year can figure it out, it's probably not that deep or uh, interesting. And uh, this just seems to be the, the, the rank being bigger than 1 seems to be just some kind of quirk over Q. This is not true over other number fields. Um, so. I think this is just a coincidence, but I thought I'd flag it just for your interest anyway. Uh, and for p is greater than 2, the nearly ordinary Selma group uh, sometimes doesn't capture this relationship properly. So sometimes you can have um, a nearly ordinary Selma group 
that has zero rank while you still have this vanishing L value. Um, so this is kind of very much a mod 2 phenomenon, and you know how mod 2 is. Characteristic 2 is always kind of weird, and things don't behave properly there. I think this is just a manifestation of that. I think I have one more slide where I'm going to tell you what the plan for the future is. Um, so these are all things that I'm thinking about, and if you have ideas about how I might go about realizing them, please do let me know. Um, so I want to do systematic computations for bigger primes. Um, pro, the mod p uh, L value shouldn't vanish all the time. Uh, the same argument doesn't work for bigger primes. So good, there's some interesting information there. It's not just kind of uniform behavior. Um, con, uh, these generic uh, big image, these generic extensions are big. Um, I've, this is a kind of typo here. This should be, either it should be GL2F3 or it should be GLF3 squared. Not both, obviously that's a dimension four representation. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, the typo's on the last slide. What can you do? Um, so this image, these images of these representations sit inside these uh, groups. And uh, your, GL, your generic GL2F3 uh, image is a degree 48. That's a degree 48 number field that you need to use. And if you're interested in doing things over an extension of Q, that's a degree 48 times D extension, right? If you want to do it over a quadratic field, that's a degree 96 extension. And these are close to the edge of what is like feasible in terms of modern computation. So that's kind of annoying. Um, I'm hoping quantum computers can figure that sort of thing out soon. We can get, then I can do my research properly. Um, okay, so I would like also a more precise local condition, um, some kind of period ring perhaps. Um, pro, this is what I want. This was the whole point from the get-go. Um, con, it's very hard and nobody knows. Um, so <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe I would have to do another PhD to figure that out. Um, so if you have any ideas what that might be, please, please do let me know. Um, and then also, uh, mod p representations that come from other locations, not just from elliptic curves. Um, uh, pro, much richer theory. Again, this is a mm, wrong uh, typo. Um, the images should be smaller, which means that this problem, big extensions, should be um, dealt with a bit more. Uh, but the con is here the L value becomes much more complicated. In fact, you get lots of L values, not just one. And it's very unclear which one is the right one to think about. Um, I think that's everything. Yes, okay, that's me, I'm done. Thank you.